Thank you. Thank, is this on? Okay. Okay, so I'm Dan Goldman. I'm from Georgia Tech, and I'm going to tell you a few projects, about, a little about a few projects that we've been doing in my group for the last few years, which is at an intersection of biology and, and physics, dynamical systems, and robotics, and some of the interesting things that one can find by hanging around at this intersection. And I think this video illustrates the kind of beauty, complexity, and to me, frankly, wonder that, that natural locomoting systems possess. Here's a lizard trying to catch a little rodent. Uh, can we turn these lights off, the top lights? And the agility and grace and speed with which these organisms pursue these tasks, all confronting uh, complex properties of the natural world, like breaking leaves and, and, and soil, uh, is actually astounding. And we would like to understand principles that, some principles that, that underlie such incredible performance. Now, uh, we, my group, thinks that this requires not just biology, not robotics, not engineering, not computer science, not only these things, but physicists to re-engage in these kind of studies. And I'll explain what I mean in a minute. Uh, these are the people who have done the work. I'm merely a representative. Some are faculty members at other universities. Some are former graduate students who are now faculty members at other universities. Some are undergraduates. Uh, and we've even had a high school student or two along the way. Uh, but the nice thing about this area and this intersection is that students from a wide range of backgrounds can, can bring their various expertises and find interests in such things. And I do apologize if it looks like I'm sweating. Somehow I picked up a flu or something, and so I don't, don't worry. I won't fall over. But if I'm sweating too much, just uh, ignore that, please. Okay. So really what I'm sort of focusing on, this is what we've realized in the last few years, is that the kind of problems we're interested in are problems of motion. And some of us are physicists in this room, but not all. And in physics, in intro physics, when we talk about motion, we basically talk about this guy. He wrote a book which had the word de motu, motion, in the title. After he died, that book was published. But these are the kind of motions one, one sees upon external forces. So if I, if a sun pulls on a planet, and the planet's going at some speed, then that planet can orbit in a ellipse. And that is a perfectly interesting kind of motion. And in fact, his, his descendant, Newton, basically formalized that kind of understanding of motion. There's another guy who some of you might have heard of, but I had not before I entered the field. Does anyone know this person? Ah, and we're in Italy, so this is great that I can say it. This is Borelli. And Borelli was more or less a contemporary of Galileo, and evidently there's a story they didn't like each other so much. Uh, I think Borelli tried to work with Galileo. But Borelli was interested in very different kinds of motion. He wrote a book, too, De Motu Animalium, uh, echoing, actually, Aristotle's De Motu from thousands of years earlier. Uh, and here is a weird sort of, well, not weird, but it's a, it's a, it's a difference. Here, these are in some sense equilibrium problems, or we can write a Hamiltonian system and solve for the uh, trajectories of the particles. These are inherently non-equilibrium problems in the sense that motion doesn't occur of an animal or a robot or a car without a driving and without a dissipation. And that immediately puts us into a different regime of, of problems. And if you remember Professor Swinney's talk on whatever it was Monday, uh, all of the beautiful phenomena that he described are largely a consequence of being outside of a thermal equilibrium. And so that's basically what these kind of motion problems are. So in some sense, we should expect interesting aspects and complexity and keep that in your head as we move along in the talk. Uh, OK, but of course, here the motion of the center mass is due to forces, but nevertheless, internal forces. And for example, in, in living systems, these are the forces generated by a contracting muscle, which then, of course, uh, interact with the environment to, to move the body. 
So how can we understand these things? Well, in the field of biomechanics, uh, which is what I learned about when I started a postdoc 15 years ago, I guess now, 12, 15 years ago, uh, in a biology department, uh, the field of biomechanics sort of has biologists have studied different kinds of animals moving through the world and have basically divided the world into three types, or had divided the world into three types. Terrestrial locomotion, typified by the, exemplified by this kangaroo hopping across hard ground. Aquatic locomotion, an eel swimming in a fluid. And aerial locomotion, a bird fly. And I just put some examples, motivating examples, of human-type devices uh, which also have to contend with these environments. This, of course, is in the news constantly now. Uh, these you might never have seen, but I'll sort of mention these briefly. And the interesting aspect, or there are many interesting aspects, um, of course we'd like to understand how birds can remain aloft, how kangaroos can hop so gracefully and, and, and energy, energetically efficiently across hard ground. Um, one thing we have to do, of course, is understand the internals of the organism. We also have to understand the interaction of the organism with the environment. And largely in the world of biomechanics, the interaction of the organism, the robot, if you're interested in saying robot, has been, has been thought to be relatively simple. That is, a foot coming into contact with hard ground, which does not slip, generates a point contact, which then leaves at some point as the foot takes off of the substrate. Um, and the substrate does not deform. In contrast, if one wants to understand motion in fluids, then one can, in principle, do so by understanding the pattern of movement of the wings or the body of these organisms, and then solving Navier-Stokes equations, if you think you can. But actually, what I've learned recently is that nobody can really do any <laughs> make solutions of Navier-Stokes equations for even a fluttering moth at this stage, which I just learned recently and surprised me. Uh, but nevertheless, if one could, in principle, solve these questions or suitable approximations thereof and calculate the forces. Yes? Uh, sorry, are, are you saying nobody can even numerically get good solutions? I would say that's true, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's Reynolds number 1,000, so it's not, but nobody has done it to the kind of level of and really validation that one would like. They're small, you have to resolve lots of measures. People have done actually okay uh, Navier-Stokes uh, simulations of eels, but in 2D. It's really quite, uh, and, and, and frankly, this is where when I entered this field, I, I heard what was, uh, these are the easy problems, these are the hard problems. That's what people said. Now, it turns out that these are still hard problems. These turn out to be really hard problems, for reasons I'll try to explain to you shortly, largely because the foot makes and breaks contact with the ground. So if you have a type of differential equation that's going to describe that, it's going to be what the applied mathematicians call a hybrid dynamical system. And it turns out when you have a hybrid, I see lots of people nodding, when you have hybrid dynamical systems, all bets are off in terms of what you understand, what your intuition from conservative, smooth systems tells you. So OK, but these are still hard problems, too. It turns out, though, that what I realized, oops, I don't know what I realized. I realized I couldn't get this to move. <laughs> ah, OK. What I realized at some point was that my love study subject as a graduate student, plus my work as a postdoc, uh, kind of had come to Show me that there was a whole world of problems, uh, and we'll call these locomotion in substrates which are not quite solids, meaning that the ground can deform upon contact, and I'll explain this video in a minute, and not quite fluids. Uh, and here's an example, and I could give many examples, but this is just one of my favorite. In fact, I'll, I'll repeat it because it's funny. Uh, this is the world of movement in granular materials or what we'll more broadly call flowable terrestrial substrates. You might think of snow or mud or leaf litter or debris. But dry granular material turns out to have particular simplifying features, largely that we can model it and understand it, which has made it amenable to, to, to understanding. So here's a video. Uh, and it turns out that it's sort of interesting that there had been many studies, uh, many field studies, behavioral 
to some extent, field studies of animals living in sandy environments. But very few or almost no mechanistic studies of the kind that biomechanists had performed for locomotion in hard ground or in fluids. And so we realized that there was a whole world to explore. And once one explores that world, one can address questions not only in movement, but can address questions more broadly in biology, including evolution and ecology. Let me show you an ecological example. Here's one. This is a snake. It's a sidewinder. It lives in the Namib Desert, southwest coast of Africa. And watch its motion. It looks particularly crazy. We studied this snake, or its cousin, in detail and found actually that it's not crazy at all. It's really simple to understand. That's not this talk today. Uh, but this snake is hunting for a little lizard. And one of the cool things, what you can do if you live in an environment which is seemingly featureless, meaning that you have no cover, no brush, no nothing to hide under, is you can use the medium itself to hide. You can bury into the material. And that's just what this little lizard does uh, to escape the snake. But the snake has developed a behavior which it essentially worms its way, burrows its way into the material, alternately solidifying and fluidizing the material, keeping its head beneath and putting its tail just enough above the substrate to not necessarily attract the lizard who doesn't care about a static tail. But the claim is this little insect, like an ant, thinks that's a leaf, something to eat. And the lizard goes for the ant <laughs> after the ant has gone for the leaf, and the snake goes for the lizard, and there's a whole food web, if you'd like, uh, in the desert. And if you don't understand the interaction, then you don't understand. Okay, so what have we done? Well, in my group, we've taken a broad comparative approach. Some people in this field pick one animal and study it for 30, 40 years. My belief as a physicist is that one can extract common principles if we take a comparative approach, picking the animals for a certain situation that, that let us address a question best. And so we've, these are just some of the animals we've studied in my group over the last 10 years now. It's a lot of fun. You can get various animals from the pet trade. You can collect them yourselves. You can go to beaches and study these cute little animals. Uh, and you can even work with the zoo Atlanta to study these animals who we're not allowed to touch because they'd kill us. Uh, and if you're in the southern portion of the United States, you can study more fire ants than you would care to. And we've, but I'm not going to tell you about all these today. Uh, okay, those are the kind of animals we've studied. The other sort of major theme in this work is that that over the years, and there's a good review, it's already 10 years old, but it gives you some sense, people have realized that, that one can't always, and this is sort of interesting, an interesting philosophical point, one, not just philosophical, but a technical point, one can't always make mathematical models of organisms. For one, of course, we, you know, it's a point as to how many parameters does one need to describe an organism's behavior. But two, often we don't have the equations of motion which govern the environments that organisms move in. So if I said to you, give me the Navier-Stokes equivalent for leaf litter or for uh, pine needles. We don't yet have that. So what people have done is that they've created what we we'll call physical models or models that exist in the physical world. And what I'm basically going to tell you today is that these models actually have been very useful in helping biomechanists uh, to some extent understand organism behavior. But to my taste, the kind of analysis and probing of the models that has been done does not reveal, has not revealed the richness and scope of the dynamics that are present in even sort of seemingly simple cockroach-like models. And that's, I think, where physics really has a role to play. And that's what I'm calling this intersection of physics and robotics. So that's basically the pitch. OK. Well, I showed this video on the first day, but it turns out that our state of building robots, uh, which have ability to move in the natural environment, is still pretty limited. The robot I showed you on the previous slide was pretty good. It's a little robot that had six legs and kind of a springy body and bounced over the ground. But people would really like to make robots with, with more sophisticated uh, locomotor and manipulation and balance capabilities of the kind we see in the natural world. And we're just not there yet. In fact, this is, this is actually a very interesting video. And now everybody in this field shows these. 
this was the these were some blooper reels from the DARPA Robotics Challenge. DARPA is, you know, is a funding agency in the US, and they spent a lot of money to put on a challenge. And that challenge was to make humanoid robots perform tasks that could help in the case of a disaster in, for example, a nuclear power plant where a robot might have to go and take a valve and and, and literally many of the examples of this, I have colleagues who were there, it was more interesting to watch paint dry than to watch these trials. They performed very slowly. We're just not there yet. And the interesting thing, of course, as I said, is that we know all the parts in these. We know exactly what the motors are spec'd at. We know the weights of all the mat. We know everything. And we can't yet put things together with appropriate coordination. Yes? Is there an obsession to make a human-like robot? So that's a great question. And yes, there is an obsession to make human-like robots. And I don't really understand it. Um, but I think that, uh, yes, there is an obsession from some, from some camps to make human-like robots. I don't think making human-like robots is the best thing to do. And, and in fact, it's really hard because you have to solve the balance problem while you're solving everything else. Uh, and um, anyway, the, but yeah, there's some obsession with making human-like robots. Uh, but here, for example, are, is a, a robot which is a not human-like robot, is a snake robot, which a colleague of mine at Carnegie Mellon, Professor Howie Chosit, makes. And he makes these robots so that they can go into actually also disaster sites and crawl through rubble and potentially locate uh, people trapped underneath. And that's his, that's his main mission in life. And they've had some success with making this limbless robot move on relatively simple ground, but have pretty pitiful locomotor capabilities when the environment gets even a little more complicated like this grass. It's quite amazing. And then the third, I love this example. If you go out to the desert southwest of the US, you find terrain like this. And here's that same cockroach-like robot, uh, which is trying to ascend a sandy slope or a gravelly slope. And these are kind of normal failure modes of this thing. So, so, so there's a whole world to look at. And what the engineers do, and let me just you know, make fun of my friends and colleagues. What the engineers do is they may show you these videos, but on average, they show you the better videos. I'll show you some of that. They, if you look on YouTube and you see Big Dog, you see these gorgeous maneuvers. Where these, oh my God, how problems are solved. But no, that, those are the rare, rare examples. I'll get to sort of why, where I think, and you can begin to see where physics comes in. Okay, so the philosophy we have here is, of course, what I said, uh, this, what I cannot create, I don't understand. I don't think you can, I would argue, you can't understand living systems if we can't build models. And I think the physical models have something to add. And here's another interesting quote, which is long, which I won't read the whole thing, but maybe I will read the whole thing. But this is a book which I highly recommend if you're interested in information theory by Pierce. And Pierce has a very inspirational, or was an inspirational quote for me in the beginning of this book. He says, I will, however, maintain that we can learn at least two things from the history of science. One of these is that many of the most, and this is what I want to emphasize, many of the most general and powerful discoveries of science have arisen not through the study of phenomena as they occur in nature, but rather through the study of phenomena in man, human-made devices, and products of technology, if you will. And he goes on to say, this is because the phenomena in man's machines are simplified and ordered in comparison with those occurring naturally, and it is these simplified phenomena that man understands most easily. So on and so forth. We see this especially in the work of Carnot. Our knowledge of aerodynamics and hydrodynamics is chiefly because of airplanes, ships exist, not because of the existence of birds and fishes. So I take this quote to heart that I and many of the leading biologists who have been studying animals now for years have taken the approach that, boy, these animals are just too hard to understand. We, our, our tools are too crude to do the kind of manipulations and systematic variation of parameters that could get us to the fundamental principle of the animals. So maybe we better study the robots. OK. OK. Well, this is what I was alluding to earlier. My colleague likes to show this video. And he gets lots of money for showing this video. And he goes all over the world. He was just at the World Economic Forum in China showing this video and letting this robot crawl up people's legs and doing all sorts of things. But if you push this robot into slightly more complicated environments, it ends up doing this. And so we'll call the robophysics today the pursuit of principles of successful and failed movement of self-propelling systems interacting with natural environments. And I think that as interesting a question is to whether you, the, if you're an engineer and you just want the robot to work, why it succeeds, I think it's just as interesting as why it fails. In fact, maybe more interesting. And this is something which my colleagues tend not to 
emphasize, but I think there's an entire richness of problems to, to be had. And studying their robots, so robots that one can make, and if you've attended our session, you see that it's not so hard now to make robots, uh, and studying success and failure. Okay. By the way, this robophysics uh, we had at the American Physical Society March meeting last year, a focus session, and we got 30 talks, uh, and it was a lot of fun over two days, and it was successful enough that we're doing it again next year. So if you're going to be at the APS March meeting and you have any interest in robots or robophysics or you'd like to submit a tall graph stack, there's the advertisement. Come <laughs> check us out. Okay. It turns out that this approach is pretty powerful. And before I move on to the meat of the talk, let me just tell you, just sort of uh, give you some, this is a paper that just appeared in Science last week, two weeks ago, in which we actually used a robot model and a living animal to understand the movement or make hypotheses about the function of a heretofore unrecognized un aspect of some of the earliest animals to move around on land, the tail. So for, for many years, people have been digging fossils out of the ground. This is a fossil of an ichthyostega that existed 360 million years ago and have spent a lot of time arguing about how the limbs of these animals could have enabled these first things, which were not quite fish and not quite, not quite terrestrial organisms, to haul themselves out on land. But largely, people dig up the bones, reconstruct the morphology, and then say, well, the limbs could have moved this much and this much, and that means the animal could have done this, that, or the other. But one thing we found over and over is that just knowing how body appendages can move doesn't necessarily tell you how the entire organism can move. And so in collaboration with a biologist who is an expert in these kind of things, we studied a little mud skipper fish, which people think is a reasonable analog to some of the earliest animals to, to crawl out on land. And what we noticed was that this animal used its limbs in a kind of primitive way. It's called a crutching gait when it was on relatively level ground. But when the ground, and we used sand as kind of a, a medium, which would be sort of like a slippery material, kind of like the mud flats that these earliest animals uh, crawled onto. When the material was at a sufficient incline, a few degrees, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, the little mud skipper fish use not only the limbs, but they use their tails in concert with the limb to get propulsion. And when we studied a robot model of the, of the mud skipper fish, we found, in fact, that using the tail on level ground didn't make much of a difference to its locomotor performance, but actually was the key enabler for movement on slightly sloped, sandy, and potentially muddy environments, largely because it buffered against misplacement of the limbs. We found by varying parameters in the robot that over a wide range of conditions, the use of a tail in appropriate coordination with the limbs enabled locomotion. Uh, okay. So, okay. Um, but here's the two examples I want to talk about today in, in this lecture. And one is something which is a technique for understanding kind of the character of movement called, called geometric mechanics, which relates uh, to the interesting problem of how a cat can manage to flip itself over while falling uh, while not changing its angular momentum. Uh, and the other is sort of a surprising example we found of colliding robots off of obstacles. And I'll first talk about this guy. Okay, to talk about this geometric mechanics, I have to tell you a little bit about what we've done with animal studies. So these are a number of animals that live in deserts around the world, elongate animals that live in deserts around the world. Some are relatively short and stubby, like this lizard here. Some are really long and skinny, and this number here in the upper right is basically characterizing the aspect ratio, the length to width of these animals. And we got interested, for other reasons, in why so many animals that live in deserts are, end up being long and skinny. I'm not going to tell you why that is today, just to tell you that we studied many of these animals. And nobody, before we got into this, had ever seen what these animals do beneath the ground. Uh, and so we got interested to study this li little lizard in particular, and we spent, I don't know, eight years studying this animal in detail. Uh, and we do so by 
using an X-ray imaging system such that we can have an X-ray source and an X-ray image intensifier, which turns the X-ray photons into visible photons and are collected by a high-speed camera, which then can resolve movement of the animal beneath the ground at 1,000 pictures per second. So we can get a picture of what's actually going on as the animal is going to the ground. These are the two students who really set this up. And these are two examples of what it looks like. Here's a little sandfish lizard, and here's a snake. This is real time, and this is slowed 10 times. The sandfish lizard actually swims through the sand at about two body lengths a second. An incredible behavior, and looks sort of like an eel as it's swimming along. And the shovel-nosed snake, which is this little snake here, uh, goes more slowly and has a more complicated waveform, but also does a pretty good job of moving through. Um, and you might, if you're into the world of small organisms, you might say to yourself, boy, this animal looks a whole lot like this animal. This animal is a C. elegans, a nematode worm. And it turns out that you would not be wrong. There is a very important correspondence between these two animals. Of course, their internal biology is nothing alike. But they both live in environments where the forces from the dissipative forces from the environment are much greater than any other forces that they can generate inertial forces. And the key ingredient is that if these animals stop wiggling, if they stop self-deforming, they stop moving. It's not like us as we swim in the ocean out here. If I stop wiggling my body or if I stroke, I can coast for a little bit. The world of the very small is very different than our world. Okay. But well, here is an illustrative example. It turns out that one of the nice things in these granular systems is that while we don't have partial differential equations, we can take a box filled with particles in the computer using the molecular dynamics techniques that Dr. Shattuck has been telling about, and we can simulate the motion of a bunch of grains, 100,000, a million grains, to good fidelity. And we can recover, uh, we can recover all sorts of things that we measure in experiment. And if we get really excited about it, we can even create virtual models of the sandfish. This is actually a little multi-motor driven model of a sandfish lizard that's wiggling itself. And the particles here are colored. This is something you can do in simulation, which you can't do in experiment. You can color particles that are moving. And the color particles that are colored red are those that are moving rapidly. And the particles that are colored blue are those that are hardly moving at all. And what you see is it basically, in this, the simulation, tells us that the sandfish lizard swims by generating a little local puddle of fluid, which it swims itself through. So it's kind of beautiful. And it's a really damped puddle of fluid. Again, if this little robot, virtual robot, stops wiggling, it stops moving instantaneously, or nearly instantaneously. OK. By the way, why, you might ask, why are these particles big? Well, because we wanted to do a simulation, which was the same number of particles in the experiment and the simulation. And so we tricked the poor sandfish lizard into swimming in particles which are three millimeters in diameter. It never sees those particles. It sees particles which are 300 microns in diameter in its natural environment. But it was happy enough to swim in these particles with just the same ability as other particles. And that allowed us to fill a box with the same number, a couple hundred thousand, I think, 300,000 in simulation as an experiment. Yes? Is there Let me get to that. That's what's coming next. Yes. Uh, Maybe is the answer, and then I'll give you the longer answer. Uh, OK, well, how do we understand this? Well, this was a guess that we made, I don't know, eight years ago, and it's turned out to be a lucky guess. Um, and the guess was that, well, there is a formulation, a kind of hydrodynamics formulation called resistive force theory, which was cooked up in the 30s, 40s, 50s. I think Taylor was one of the first people to make it, and Gray um, was another. Uh, Light Hill is another name in this world. Uh, and it's sort of how to, solve, how to solve problems of swimming in a fluid if you don't have a computer to some extent. And that's what the case was 34 years ago. And it's a very simple formulation as befitting what I just said. And basically, you take an object. In this case, it looks like something like a spermatozoa, but it could be anything. And that object is, a, is composed of lots of little elements. And the, you specify the shape of the object as a function of time in its reference frame. And you then 
at each element of the of the of the object, you compute forces on that element. And those forces, for example, if the object is moving downward in this way, here, there was going to be a reaction force which is going to be in the opposite direction. Uh, and you can decompose that force into two components, a perpendicular and parallel component. And the component of the perpendicular force in this direction, subtracting off the component of the parallel force in this direction will give you the net force on that element. And then the game is to solve for the velocity of the entire shape while it's undulating, which exactly doing an integral over the entire body, integrating the force over the body, balances all those forces because inertia is zero. And that's what you do. And so you put in any old wave shape you want, and you say, what velocity of translation and rotation will I get, which will balance all the forces and torques? And that's it. And it turns out that this is not a great approximation uh, in fluids for which it was developed. And the person who showed that most recently, the people who showed that most recently, one is over there, Professor Swinney, and Bruce is, he, and Bruce is back there. It turns out that people have been using this approximation for years, but no one had really tested it at the level that been, we like to test things in, in this world. And it turns out it's not a good approximation for the kinds of, for the kinds of problems it was uh, uh, ostensibly to be applied to. Uh, now, to be fair, if you ask the mathematicians, they'll say, of course, we knew it was not a good approximation. You need to do something more fancy. But nobody had ever really tested it. So it turns out, though, that in the granular systems, it's a great approximation. And if you're interested, a colleague of mine, Ken Cameron at MIT, has recently shown why it's such a great approximation. What do I mean by approximation? The approximation is, or the, the scheme is the following. This integral doesn't have any, contains nothing about uh, elements. An element here knows nothing about an element over here. An element here knows nothing about an element over here. So these are completely independent, all of these forces. And where does one get the force uh, on an element for a given velocity of movement? Well, in the fluid, you use Stokes uh, equations. And so for Stokes uh, equations, you have for a long, thin cylinder, a force in this direction is roughly double the force in this direction. Uh, and so you have that plus this sort of superposition. And this, what really kills the resistive force theory in low Reynolds number situations is the superposition principle is not a good one. Elements here generate flow fields which affect the kind of forces that are experienced by elements over here. But in the granular systems, for some reason, uh, that doesn't happen. And so it turns out that the granular resistive force theory, and I'm not giving you any of the details, actually is quite good and gives us answers that we could compare to experiment to a few percent over a wide range of conditions. Yeah? Well, no, the viscous fluids are quite dissipative as well. We think it's related to the we think it's related to actually that the underlying equations which govern the granular material seem to have a hyperbolic character, whereas the equations that govern the, the fluid case have a parabolic character. And the hyperbolic PDE, the pres presumable hyperbolic PDEs, are very local somehow. So we don't know why it works so well, but Cameron has now shown this, and he has a paper, which is a couple papers on the archive. Anyway, but one can do these calculations, and here's some animation showing this. Uh, and with the key ingredient is that the granular forces are somewhat different in form than the low Reynolds number forces, but not so. So uh, all this to say is that we have a, a scheme for calculating forces on bodies that are moving through the environment. But it's a scheme that actually then makes us have to worry about every force over the every segment of the body. It just is sort of an inelegant way to think about it. And that's what I want to show. Sure. Inelegant, but it actually works. So, for example, that sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I can use the theory to to make predictions. So, here is a measure of the displacement that the animal would go as a function of uh, for an undulation cycle, as a function of the amplitude of the wave it puts on its body. And actually, I'm going to skip this because I don't need to talk about this. It's not so important. Uh, okay, let me get to what is so important or what I think is the most interesting thing. It turns out that, that and this gets to your question, that, that the next part of the story is that, that because we can calculate things so nicely in these granular swimming problems, 
we've actually been able to use a technique which was invented to try to understand more broadly locomotion problems in, in the world of the very small. And if you've not read this paper, has anyone read this paper? Okay, yeah, but if you're not, you, if you haven't, you should. This is a great paper by Purcell, a very famous physicist, uh, who wrote a paper about um, life at low Reynolds number. And he emphasized this point that it's very different. It's more like Aristotle's world, that force causes velocity. And here, if I'm a swimmer at a high Reynolds number, inertial forces relative to damping forces, the high Reynolds number, if I stop self-deforming, that's the language, I, I stop, I, I, can, I can continue to swim or move for a little while. Whereas if I'm a very small organism, uh, a small Reynolds number, then if I stop self-deforming, I stop moving. And Purcell created a kind of fictional animal, which people now call the Purcell three-link swimmer. Uh, and it basically looks like a Swiss Army knife, which has a link and another link and another link. And the two links are specified by two angles, theta one and theta two. And the whole game, because time doesn't matter, no longer matters in this problem, the whole game is to vary the angles as a function of time, or vary the angles over some set of angles, and, and watch what happens to the locomotor. And what one does is then represent the, the path of the two angles in a, what we'll call a configuration space, where the two angles are varied relative to each other. So in this case, these sequence, this is taken from his paper, the sequence of shape that this little robot undergoes can be represented as a square in this configuration space. Nothing complicated. Well, it turns out that, and I learned this because this guy, Al Shapir, is a professor at the University of Kentucky, and I met him. He came to visit us at Georgia Tech, and he was a student of Professor Wilczek, who was, I think, at Santa Barbara at the time, yes, uh, and now at MIT, another Nobel Prize winner. And they wrote a sequence of papers which if you ask most physicists about these papers, most physicists sort of scoff because this is a paper which is self-propulsion low Reynolds number and is ostensibly about locomotion. But the first line of the abstract is we formulate the problem of self-propulsion low Reynolds number in terms of a gauge field over the shape of spaces, which is incomprehensible to most people working in fluid dynamics. In fact, they had a lot of trouble getting their papers into Journal of Fluid Mechanics, uh, largely because of this formulation. And it was sort of forgotten by physicists, as far as we can tell. Uh, but it was not forgotten by the engineers. And it turns out an entire group of engineers, starting in the 70s and 80s, uh, some at Caltech, some at Harvard, basically built on the ideas that were, were talked about in this paper. Uh, and and well, I'll explain a little bit in, in one more slide and create a scheme which allows one to actually calculate and use this, what we'll call, geometric approach to understand the character of locomotion. I just want to give you a flavor of it. And the idea is the following. You connect sort of two spaces. One is the space of internal degrees of freedom of a swimmer. So in the case of my Purcell swimmer, I have alpha 1 and alpha 2. And that specifies the uh, internal degrees of freedom and, and specifies the variables that define the shape. And the other space, in this case SE2, is the space of 2D rigid body kinematics. So the body center of mass, position, and its orientation. And then the game is to figure out how paths in this space link to paths in this space. And that's the whole story. And everything else then is calculating this, uh, doing, doing good calculations. Uh, it turns out that, that, that the engineers um, make a guess that in many systems, the body velocity can be linearly related by a matrix to the joint velocities for sufficiently small joint velocities. Uh, and this linear relation is called a connection matrix. Now, I want to just tell you one. I'm going to run out of time, so let me just skip ahead. I'm not going to talk about the connection matrix. It turns out that, that just take my word for that these diagrams, one ends up with diagrams which have vectors as diagrams, and one calculates then movement by doing essentially a line integral and computing the line integral of this local vector, dotting this local vector into the local uh, 
uh, displacement along this line integral, and that ultimately gives you the displacement or translation. But line integrals are hard, and so what people have done uh, is, because you have to worry about the vectors, have used Stokes' theorem essentially to turn a line integral into an area integral. And if one does that, then in fact one has a very beautiful picture that emerges. In order to understand locomotion, now, you no longer worry about all the forces on the body at any instant in time. About that. You just worry about drawing paths in some shape space. These call the, they call these the height function space, and this is a 3D representation, and this is a contour map representation. And if you enclose a certain amount of signed area, positive is red and negative is black, you will either translate or rotate depending on the space you enclose. And so here, for example, is a, they call these height functions, is a height function uh, which allow visualization of how shape change lead to net translation rotation. And so here, for example, is what is called a circle gate. So I'm going to make a circular path in this height function space. And as I do so, I'm enclosing area which is negative in the x coordinate. I'm enclosing in the y coordinate area which is positive and then negative, so the area integral will be zero. And in the theta, I enclose positive and then negative, and so the area integral is also zero. And the area for a given coordinate tells you how much you'll translate or rotate. So it's kind of cool. So here, this says that there will be uh, movement in the y and the theta of this middle link as I trace through this path, this space, but once I've completed a circuit, I will have translated in X, but not gone anywhere in Y or theta. And the cool thing is that no one had ever tested these, and I like this quote, I won't say it long, but science walks forward on two feet, namely theory and experiment. I firmly believe this. No one had ever really tested this beautiful framework for 30 or 40 years. It's quite amazing. Until we wrote this paper a few years back, we built a little robot, not unlike the robots you're building in your hands-on session, uh, and the robot, again, has servo motors that, that you can control the position as a function of time to whatever you care for. Uh, and you can make the robot like this. And you could do a DEM simulation to actually be able to watch the grains. And you can do the theories as well. And I'll now get to your question about the scallop theorem, because what the scallop theorem says is that if I were to take, in, in this language, if I were to take a path in this, which encloses no area, a scallop theorem is a purely reciprocal motion, it's going to be a line in this space, I shouldn't go anywhere. And the granular material turns out that it's a pretty good approximation when you're sufficiently deep. Um, okay. One can then do interesting things, and this is where I think it gets kind of beautiful, in the sense that I have here, for example, the x height function, and red is positive and, and black is negative. And if I were to make a path in this space, a circular path, and again, the, the, the thing is I no longer now worry about how I'm moving my appendages relative to each other. I'm just thinking about a path in this space. If I take a path in this space as a circle of a certain radius, and I were to double that radius or half that radius, well, my geometric picture now tells me that the locomotion performance is going to go like the area. And so doubling a radius, I'm going to go like the area, which is the square. So I should go four times as far. And so one can actually do the experiment and measure the displacement of the robot as a function of the stroke amplitude. And then one can see that if I flap my arms with double the amplitude, I will go four times as far and one instantly gets an understanding of the curve, which wouldn't, wouldn't have had without it. So I think that's kind of nice. Uh, you might notice that there's gates up here which are significantly higher. And by the way, the experiment is the black, and the gray is the DEM simulation, and the red is the theory. And so the theory does a pretty good job for stroke amplitudes of, uh, which aren't too large. Um, OK. One can do fun things. Say I want to go around and not enclose any area. I only want to enclose area of a certain sign. Well, here's how I do it. I go and I trace this sort of funny looking what we call butterfly. 
in the space, and here I'm going along the zero sets, and I'm making sure not to leak into any of the positive area. And that actually is this weird looking way to move your body, which I don't think you ever would have figured out without this stuff, but actually is the most, the, that gives you the most displacement uh, going around in a cyclical way uh, than any other gate. And it turns out you could do even more interesting things. Suppose they wanted to rotate in place. Well, what you do is you go around in one direction in the theta space and around in another direction in the theta space. And because the symmetry of the x and y diagrams, you will not translate, but you will rotate in place. Okay. And there's the experiment comparing with the theory, and you can see it does quite well. And then the cool thing is that, one of the cool things, it becomes then, at least for this three-link swimmer, you now have a way to systematically think about and compare different environments. Oh, here's granular and here's a viscous fluid, to the extent you trust the calculations, the, for the resistive force theory calculation for a viscous fluid. But now the symmetry and character of these diagrams gives you a sense for how movement can, uh, can or cannot happen. Okay. The question is, though, and then I'm going to stop with this section. Just let me just tell you, because these are some of the most recent examples. That's the Purcell swimmer. It looks nothing like an organism. It doesn't even look like a robot for the most part. Here's something that sort of looks like a robot. It's our sand swimming robot. It has a bunch of servo motors connected together. It can drive a wave down the body. Can we apply this stuff to systems with more than two degrees of freedom that look more like real living systems? And the answer is we've discovered, let me just get to here, the answer is, and I think I'll skip most of this, the answer is yes. It turns out that what one does is decompose a shape into basically two bases, and that gives you a good approximation to many of the shapes that you care about. And this, I don't know if it impresses you or not, but this is sort of hot off the press. This is a little lizard. This is the, this is where the lizard, uh, this is a measure of how bent its body is during its wave shape. And this is how far it goes per undulation cycle. This is where the lizard lives. And this is the height function uh, for this kind of shape. And it says that if this lizard wants to go the furthest per undulation cycle, it has to enclose this area. This, I think it's this uh, green or red. And that's more or less where it sits. So these geometric pictures one can use to good effect. OK. I'm going to skip that. Let me just tell you one last thing, and then I'll quit. Uh, I have about five minutes or so. Is that right? Five. Three minutes. Three, okay. Three minutes is fine. Okay. The last thing I'll show you is this, that playing with these robots can give you all sorts of interesting surprises. And I just want to show you one of the surprises. So we got into a problem years back of studying how animals and robots move around on kind of heterogeneous terrain. And it seemed like a hard problem, and we didn't know what to do. And so the first thing we said is, well, we'll make a simulation where we'll make an infinite lattice of boulders, and we'll let the robot run around the boulders. And if we could only understand the interaction of a single boulder with a robot, for example, we could calculate uh, something like diffusion coefficients of where a robot might end up over a long time. Uh, and I'm going to skip some of this, yes. Um, but it turns out that this idea of, of objects banging into other objects, particularly self-propelled objects banging into other objects, leads to all sorts of interesting non-trivial dynamics. This is one of my favorite examples. This is a robot which has no motors and is just passively walking down a hill uh, with no control at all. It just, it's the sequencing of collisions and the appropriate timing and swing of the legs, all passive, which allow it to walk. This is an example many of you have, have, have heard about. Uh, of which a little droplet of water being oscillated on, a, on a, a plate of fluid actually can display quantum mechanical like effects. I'm sure most of these things for this. Well, so we got interested. So suppose I have a limbless locomotor, and suppose I want to understand where it goes in a bunch of heterogeneous elements. If I think of the snake robot like uh, a scatterer, should it scatter more like a particle or more like a wave? And so we wondered this. And so Jennifer Reeser, who's in the back there, built a little robot. And here's the robot. And this is what the robot does. I'll be very quick on this just to show you. And the only control here on the robot is the robot is 
prescribing its shape as a function of time so that it, and it has wheels on its, on its belly so that it uh, basically is trying to push itself along the ground. And when it hits a peg, it just bumps in and the, the forces from the reactive force on the peg coupled to the reactive forces from the ground tell it where to go. And one can do this over hundreds of experiments. And Jennifer made this nice movie. And you can, the color here will tell you the probability of what the angle, the scattering angle that robot takes. And lo and behold, you get a kind of discretization in the scattering angles. And you can then do this in computer simulation. And let me get to this, where you can then put lots of pegs and make a longer robot and run hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of simulations and measure the scattering angle. And this is what you get. And so we've diffracted the robot snake. And I love this, and I think I'll end with this. So this is one of my favorite quotes at Feynman. It always was interesting to me in that he says, in this chapter, we tackle immediately the basic element of the mysterious behavior of the most strange form. We choose to examine a phenomenon which is impossible, absolutely impossible to explain in any classical way, which has in it the heart of quantum mechanics. In reality, it contains the only mystery. We cannot make the mystery go away, explain it, blah, blah, blah. This is a very uh, powerful statement. And, and here is his, here's the double slit experiment with photons, and here's the double slit experiment with a robot, and I think I will end there, and you can take that as you will, and thank you for paying attention.